Just tell give tell me what your name is. Pramila Malik. And you're from Minisik, New and, York. And why are you here? I'm here to support a uh, a community that is uh, unfairly f uh, being assaulted by gas infrastructure, just like our community in Minisink was. Um, I'm here to support them and to show my solidarity because we're all connected. We're connected by the pipelines that poison us and we're connected by the air we all breathe and the water we all drink and we're connected by our common humanity. So tell me what happened at Minisink. Were you aware that a compressor station was planned to be built nope, there? Nope, not at all. Why not? Um, well, because they come in really quietly and covertly. They make backdoor deals with you know, the local political players and elected officials and regulators and way before the public is notified. Everything is already planned out um, and not officially but unofficially permitted. And when, by the time the public is informed, um, it's, it's pretty much a done deal. And in fact, when we first received notification that um, this project was being proposed, um, we were told by our local town officials that it was a done deal. At that point, we were told it was a done deal. Um, and this is when they were just apparently, this is even before they filed their application with FERC, when they held the open house um, in our community. Um, at that point, no paperwork had been filed officially, and we were told it was a done deal. By your local township? By, um, unofficially, by, by our local town council members, yes. And did you try to contact your, uh, your senator? Yeah, we did. Um, they pretended they didn't know anything about it, and we invited them to a meeting in which we gave them a whole range of reports and data on health impacts from compressor stations, begged and pleaded for their assistance, and we received all kinds of promises and assurances that they were going to help, and they did nothing. And what about, um, okay, I'm going to the story about why they were doing it did you get did you get conflicting stories about things and well we were told that they needed to build this compressor station to increase gas supplies to northeast markets um, because the pipeline um, there was a bottleneck bottleneck in the pipeline what was the bottleneck um, well, there's a short segment of pipeline called the Neversink segment, which is where the pressure goes from a 36-inch li line to a from a 30-inch line to a 24-inch line, and then back again to a 30-inch line, and that's a bottleneck. So the company argued that to that they needed the compressor station right at that spot in order to increase the pressure um, to keep the the gas flowing along the pipeline. Now, we were able to disprove the necessity of having a compressor station there, we proposed an alternative plan where they could upgrade the Neversink segment, expand it, and put a compressor station, a much smaller one, on property that they already owned. And we were able to document and prove that it was a safer alternative, a viable alternative, a structurally and hydraulically more sound alternative, and it's on property they already owned, which would have required a much smaller compressor station, which would have meant um, uh, 45 percent less fuel emissions, um, 45 percent less energy costs. So it was an all-around better plan. The company's response was that it was it was going to cost them too much to replace the Neversink segment, and that it was environmentally more um, uh, problematic. However, we were we got com internal company documents that indicated that they planned to do exactly that after they built this compressor station in Minisink. So, so in other words, they were already they, they already always had in the works. They already the had it. Yeah, so it was basically a game. They were gonna build the compressor station there in Minisink and after it was built, then they would apply for the expansion of that Neversink segment uh, under the pretext of there being too much pressure on the pipeline. So it's a big a big racket, a big game. When you went to the hearing in your township what happened when you went there? 
Well, um, what kind of, I mean, did the community just show up unanimously? Well, the first, no, the first meeting, the scoping meeting, I mean, the first open house, um, the company was supposed to inform everybody living within a half mile. And there were literally um, maybe about seven or eight families there. Um, and we have 200 families living in, within a half mile. So obviously, a vast majority of people were not informed. Um, so, and they held it in August when a lot of people are on vacation. But what we did is we went to the open house and it was all smokes and mirrors, a whole bunch of, you know, half-truths, lies, deceptions, omissions. Uh, we were told that there's nothing coming out of the compressor station except for water vapor. Um, but in any case, we, we informed our community. We mobilized everybody. And when they had the official scoping meeting that FERC holds, at that meeting, we had um, a, 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 a full room of over 100 families. And um, people were, of course, outraged. And the, com the, commun uh, the company was not expecting that pushback. And we fought it hard. I mean, we, we put up a really big fight. And in fact, the uh, president of Millennium Pipeline, the company we were fighting, he used to go to industry conferences and brag about the fact that he had the most challenged compressor station in the nation. Um, okay, I got two other questions. These might be difficult for you, but what happened to the people who protest after that compressor was installed? Um, well, I mean, one of the primary, and I'll give you an example, one of the primarily outspoken people was uh, Nicholas Russo, of course. Yeah. Nick left, he moved. He moved out of Minisync. He sold his house well below what he paid for it um, at a considerable financial loss, but being a 9-11 first responder and having lived through um, that experience and the aftermath, he realized that his health was not worth the cost and he sold his house and left. Okay, another question is that this is from my personal experience. I know that in communities in upstate, people say that others will tell you to be quiet because it's impacting their property values. There's a little bit of that. There's a little bit of that. There's a, you know, a, there were a few people who didn't want us to put signs up because, you know, they fought it as hard as they could. And when, you know, they felt like they couldn't fight it, they wanted to sell their property. But I think people, I mean, people are still pulling together. We still have our court case pending. Um, you know, different people are dealing with the challenges in different ways. Some people, you know, are trying to sell their homes. Other people are, you know, you go through this psychological process of, of um, acquiescence where you convince yourself that maybe it's not going to be so bad. And other people know it's going to be bad and are still fighting it, you know, like me. Well, it is a beautiful it's a beautiful area it's an area worth saving and we're all connected i mean you know it's it's not that far from you know you know as josh fox is in his film everybody's backyard is connected to everybody else's we're all interconnected and so you can't really escape i think i think people who realize that you can't escape it because we live in this holistic ecological system we all share this planet the borders between states and towns are meaningless. Um, I think once you realize that, you realize that you can't just run away. You have to fight it. Okay. Uh, just two more closing questions. One is, what was your experience with FERC? FERC is um, an enabler of the gas industry. They are seemed like they are created to serve the interest of the gas industry. They have a very cozy relationship um, with... Um, the gas industry and their lobbyists and they are not accustomed to interacting with the public or answering to the public at all. They're not held accountable by anybody. Really. Okay. And you could take your time at answering this one is uh, any last, you know, words you want to tell anybody that you haven't said already. Uh just, you know, what I've been saying for a while that we're we're really at a fork in the road right now. And um you know, one end is further addiction to fossil fuels, further pain and misery and suffering for the average human being, um, you know, more global warming and catastrophic events. And the other is a, is a path to, um, you know, helping our planet recover and recuperate. And it's the only viable option forward. So 
you know, we have to choose now which direction we go. Thank you, Pramila. Let's, uh, let me give you just one other question. Sure. Have you had any smells or anything from yeah. there? Yeah. What kind of smells and um, what kind of events? Well, you can smell gas, especially... Oh, well. okay. So, yeah, recently there was a blowdown event on Friday, actually, and... Just Friday this... Uh, this past Friday, and um, I guess a, a little over a week it, ago. How long did it last? Um, it lasted about an hour, two hours, but the thing is that they announced the blowdown, but prior to the blowdown, people had started smelling gas a good 24 to 40 hours beforehand, which means that they had probably been venting even before the actual announcement of the blowdown. And yeah, people smelled gas in their homes, outside, everywhere. There are times, other times we smelled uh, ammonia in the air, um, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's noxious odors, noise, it's, it's, and you know, it's more than just being an annoyed, you know, those are just the short-term adverse impacts. It's the long-term impacts that are really worrisome, you know. Okay, that's good. Thanks. Sorry, it's cold.